First and foremost, thank you so much for being here. My name is Stacy Manna, and I'm the Community Outreach Director for Pandas Network. I'm also a proud mom to two children, both who suffered from pandas in 2020 after strep infections, but are now healed and thriving. Tonight, we will, we will be discussing pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infections, also known as pandas, and pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, also known as PANS. Both disorders occur after an infection. Mm. Excuse me, brain inflammation occurs when the body's immune system mistakenly attacks healthy brain cells, leading to autoimmune processes that affect central nervous system function. An affected child generally has a sudden, dramatic change in personality. It is not uncommon for a child to go to bed and wake up unrecognizable, while some children have mild symptoms that become noticeably worse after an infection. The reason I plan this meeting is simple. Local families need your help. Many are being denied medical care and still being told that this disorder is not real. Whether you are, are an educator, medical provider, or dentist, the information you will hear tonight is important for you to make a clinical assessment. Our families are desperate to be accepted and get their child the proper care they are in need of. Most, most are currently traveling out of state for care. When educators and providers are aware of symptoms, diagnostic criteria, and treatment options, children can be healed. Tonight you will hear from Dr. Kovacevic, who has treated patients with the disorder over, for over 20 years, and Chris Kelly, who is a local specialist that has treated patients over the last two years. We will also end with a Q&A session. It is our goal for you to leave here feeling supported with resources and knowledge to help our families. With that being said, we will get started. First, I will be showing you an eight minute video that summarizes recent research from Columbia University Neuroscience Division. This research, led by Dr. Dreet Nagayu, shows how the blood vessels of the brain that normally form a blood-brain barrier to prevent immune cells and antibodies from getting inside the brain may be damaged due to peripheral inflammatory and immune processes arising after multiple group A strep infections. Similar mechanisms are being proven in long COVID. Here we're going to summarize cutting edge research in the area of neuropsychoimmunology that addresses how the brain, mind, and immune system are affected by the disease and how they interconnect with one another. Looking at the brains of pandas and pans children, how peripheral infection triggers brain inflammation. This animation will show you some of the new research conducted by several research labs related to the diagnosis and treatment of pandas and PANS, which was made possible by the generous donations of PANDAS network families. This science shows the imperative of early diagnosis and treatment for this complex patient population in order to prevent progressive brain damage. Pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infection, or PANDAS, and pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, or PANS, are a group of related autoimmune or autoinflammatory disorders that affect the central nervous system, or CNS. These disorders are triggered by infections, either bacterial, viral, or fungal. They occur when the body's immune system inappropriately attacks healthy brain tissue, triggering neurological and or psychiatric symptoms. Post-infectious responses in pandas and pans primarily affect a region of the brain known as the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are a group of interconnected structures within the brain that are associated with regulating functions such as motor movement, cognitive and emotional response, and procedural learning. As a consequence, pandas and pans are characterized primarily by an abrupt onset of abnormal movement and or psychiatric symptoms. How do peripheral bacterial or viral infections cause brain inflammation? Repeated exposure to an infectious agent, such as group A streptococcus or group A strep, or viruses like COVID-19, cause the body to launch an immune response against the infectious agent. The body produces antibodies to fight the invading infection. However, in certain patients, this immune response leads to the production of abnormal antibodies known as autoantibodies. 
which attack the host's own healthy brain cells. How these autoantibodies enter the brain is not well understood. However, recent research in both mice and pandas children may provide an answer. In the mouse disease model for pandas and pans, repeated group A strep infections of the mucous membrane in the upper nasal cavity lead to the production and accumulation of Th17 and Th1 lymphocytes in the surrounding tissue. Th17 and Th1 lymphocytes are pro-inflammatory immune cells that are generated to fight the bacterial infection. However, in many autoimmune diseases, these cells may cause a misdirected immune response that targets the host's own healthy cells. Research studies in mice suggest that Th17 lymphocytes may travel along the nerves that sense smells, called olfactory nerves, from the nose to the brain. Once in the brain, Th17 cells release inflammatory cytokines that are important for immune cell communication. These cytokines also stimulate specialized immune cells of the CNS called microglia, which release their own inflammatory cytokines. In addition to microglial activation, Th17 lymphocytes release two pro-inflammatory cytokines called IL-17A and GM-CSF, which trigger the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, or BBB. The BBB is a highly selective semi-permeable boundary of specialized cells, known as endothelial cells, that line the blood vessels of the brain and prevent molecules in the circulating blood from indiscriminately entering the brain. These inflammatory cytokines cause the BBB to break down in two ways. First, they damage the tight junction, or TJ proteins, of the endothelial cells. TJ proteins join the endothelial cells of the BBB to one another and prevent the transport of molecules from the blood to the brain. The second way in which the cytokines break down the BBB is by increasing transcytosis, or the transport of molecules within endothelial cells and into the brain. How is this relevant to pandas and pans? The damage to tight junctions and the increase in endothelial transcytosis allows potential autoantibodies circulating in the blood to enter the brain, where they can cause further damage. Recent work from Yale University with pandas and pans children has shown that once these autoantibodies cross the BBB, they attack a group of neurons in the basal ganglia, called cholinergic interneurons, that are important for movement and mood. In addition, work from the University of Oklahoma has suggested these antibodies interact with dopamine receptors in the basal ganglia, triggering their abnormal activation and causing mood and movement disorders. Recent studies in the mouse model have further demonstrated that blocking IL-17A function does not prevent the entry of Th17 lymphocytes into the brain. However, this treatment is very effective in blocking the activation of microglia, and preventing blood-brain barrier damage, improving disease outcomes. Therefore, therapies that target IL-17A may prove beneficial in children suffering from pandas and pans. Human studies have identified that a set of pro-inflammatory cytokines are highly elevated in pandas and pans children at the acute phase of the disease. Additionally, these pro-inflammatory cytokines are able to break down the BBB in research experiments. This implies that they may potentially trigger BBB breakdown in patients. This is the first study that has identified Th17 lymphocytes and cytokines IL-17A and GM-CSF as major players in causing the breakdown of the BBB after repeated group A strep infections in mice. Additional studies are currently underway to examine the role of Th17 cells or other immune cells in humans suffering from pandas and pans. In order to improve the diagnosis of these CNS disorders, it is imperative to develop biomarkers that can be used to test for the disease. These tests can range from analysis of cerebrospinal fluid, blood tests for inflammatory cytokines, and using dynamic contrast-enhanced MRI imaging tools to detect BBB breakdown during flare-ups of the disease. 
Existing therapies that target IL-17A have already been developed and are being used to treat certain autoimmune diseases. These therapies may prove beneficial in children suffering from PANDAS and PANS. The findings from the mouth studies indicate that there is previously undiscovered communication between the CNS and adaptive cellular immunity to infections. This may help lead to understanding how many other CNS autoimmune disorders develop, such as Sydenham's chorea, a disease related to pandas and pans, multiple sclerosis, NMDAR encephalitis, and long COVID. Additionally, these findings support the need for early identification of pandas and pans cases and the critical role of immune modulating therapies in treating these disorders. Thank you for watching. We hope this has shed light on the mechanisms in a difficult CNS disease. Groundbreaking research and treatment protocols will continue to be published. Please stay tuned for the latest developments. So now I would like to introduce you to leading PANDAS physician, Dr. Miroslav Kovacevic. All right, <clears throat> listen, uh, June uh, is kind of interesting month. My first patient that I can recall was in June 1999, so that makes it about 24 years. Since that time, I have seen probably about 6,000, 6,500 patients. And so my statistics are not only pretty voluminous, but I think most of the people out there uses them uh, for their purpose. Now. The purpose of my speech is really purely clinical. I would like everybody to understand because, you know, we can go through all this stuff. You know, kid is having these symptoms, kid is having these symptoms. What I want everybody to understand, what is exactly going on in the kid's head? Because once you understand that, the rest of it is kind of easy. History of pandas goes to late 80s. You know, at NIH, there was a quote-unquote gossip that strep could be related uh, to OCD. Uh, unfortunately, the main supporter of idea at that time died a couple of years later, and so we had to wait until 1996 when Sue Svido and uh, Albert <coughs> uh, Allen put together the first presentation of pandas. Uh, since that time, okay, the history is kind of weird. Uh, as soon as they came up with the idea, there was a barrage of fire uh, from psychiatrists, from uh, you know infectious diseases guy, etc., trying to discount the report. So the NIH kind of went into hiding. They stopped funding the PANDAS research. And so the only two people who did the research from that time, what is about 1999 middle, until 2010 was Beth Latimer at Bethesda and myself. By 2010, we both accumulated enough cases, worked out the statistics, and finally presented it back to NIH, and at that time they agreed that they would reinstitute the research in PANDAS. Now, the question that every parent asked me, well, you know, I heard that diagnosis of PANDAS is controversial. All right, what does that mean, okay? Uh, it's kind of funny that you have a patient who has a diagnosis of OCD, and that's not controversial. It's just a description of symptom. You can have an OCD because you were abused, uh, severe trauma, etc. So nobody questions that, but when you come to PANDAS, everybody's up in arms. Second uh, a reply that the doctors like to give to the parents is I don't believe into it. Well, you know, to my knowledge, medicine is not a religious exercise where you believe or you don't believe. So you take effects and you run with them. So 
I think that controversy is pretty much over. And the only real problem remaining is lack of full evidence that every case of pandas is caused by strep. Now, I would disagree with some of the statements made on the, in the previous slides, okay? I personally believe there are only two microorganisms that technically can cause pandas. One is strep group A, and the second one is Epstein-Barr virus. Reason, both of them use mimicry as a defense mechanism, and therefore they are somehow similar. Now, my population, as I said, was probably around 6,000, a little bit more, okay? And out of those, I've treated with uh, immunomodulating therapy about 2,000, okay? Um, now, this is part that is important. Uh, the onset, the time, age when the patient shows up in doctor's office for the first time, it's usually between six and nine years of age. However, carefully taken past history will tell you that most of them have an onset of symptoms as early as two to four years of age. So please keep that in mind. Boys are more affected two to one rather than girls, okay? And there is almost an unavoidable phenotype that these kids present with. As a rule, these kids are highly intelligent. I have seen probably close to 1,000 IQs done on these kids. I don't do them, but the doctors did before me. And I'm yet to see the kid with IQ less than 125. So they're highly intelligent. They're very uh, communicative, okay? And they usually act much more mature than the average child of their age. They're also extremely good student, but they prefer the company of adults versus children. They do have some OCD specs. They like tightness, they like orderness, they like uh, their room to be in certain order, they don't like their toys to be moved, etc. So that's the basis on which pandas comes in. Now, there is clear inheritance pattern, and that is not based just on the group of patients I've treated, but on the worldwide population. So, as a rule, 80% of the patients who are diagnosed with pandas will have a positive family history on mother's side of the family. And it's usually OCD, anxiety, etc. 20%, however, will have a positive history on father's side of the family. And what is fascinating, that usually the symptom present on father's side of the family are tics or adventitious movements. There is, as I said, specific worldwide distribution. In the United States, ethnical background does play an important role. The highest incidence of pandas is in Jewish ethnical background. Second highest is uh, Italian background. And third one is East European background. If you look at other continents, in Europe, the highest incidence is in Italy, second is Greece, third are Dutch. Then you go to Asia, highest incidence is in India, and obviously China, Vietnam. I've had a few patients, but you cannot make any conclusion. However, what is fascinating, that Japan has very low incidence of pandas. One other thing that is kind of confusing is I've had probably 50, 60 sets of identical twins. I'm yet to see both twins ending up with pandas. It's always one. 
So we are trying to design the study around that and figure out what is the genetic difference. All right. So. The symptoms of pandas vary from patient to patient. They vary from episode to episode. So I will give you incidents, statistical incidents of certain symptoms in the population of patients with pandas, and that might help you out. So, general anxiety is almost presented, you know, presents itself in every patient I have ever seen. Behavioral regression is present in 98% of the patients. There is a separation anxiety, there is a baby talk, temper tantrums, etc. Sleep disorder has been reported in 84% of the patients. Obsessive compulsive symptoms, we have found at least one OCD symptom in all patients. Now, they may be, you know, very visible, they might be subclinical, but they have been present in every patient. Now, other symptoms that are a little bit less frequent, it's uh, inability to concentrate. That has been identified in 87% of the patients. Hyperactivity and inattentiveness, uh, short-term memory impairment, deterioration in learning ability, particular in mathematics. That has been seen in about 62% of patients. 18% of the patients have had uh, auditory or visual hallucinations. Eating disorder, typical anorexia, is present in my group in 17% in of the patients. Now, there is some disparity between my statistics and NIH statistics. NIH has reported 30 to 40% incidence of uh, uh, eating disorders. However, I'm very strict. For me, anorexia is not just refusing to food, but it must be weight loss of at least 10%. So therefore, you know, we can discuss who is right, okay? Then there is a selective mutism that I have seen in about 7% of the patients. Intermittent dystonia presents in about 3% of the patients. And what is fascinating, these kids are frequently misdiagnosed as epilepsy. They simply just collapse, okay? They are fully conscious, they don't release the urine. So you might find these kids frequently referred to neurologists. And then there is emotional lability. So they go from one, you know, end of the spectrum to other end of the spectrum. Now, looking at a kid with pandas in your office, essentially they look perfectly fine unless they are severely affected. So there are, however, things you have to look for, okay? Number one is these kids, when they get to the office, they usually have that hyper alert, uh, you know, posture, fight and flight. So if you pay attention to that, you will see that. Second important thing is these kids' facial expressiveness is severely diminished. So their faces look like a mask. Frequently, they speak in very low tone, low voice, okay, and don't look at you in the eyes. One of the characteristics of you, it's a urinary frequency, enuresis, especially in boys, and there could be also during the day leakage of urine. Finally, parents will frequently tell you when the child has a full symptoms, that his eyes are huge. Well, it's not the eyes, it's the pupils. You have a madrasis, and if you look at the kid carefully, even in the office, you're going to notice it. One other thing that these kids have, and I will discuss it a little bit later, is 
persistent, intermittent, non-specific stomach pains. They complain for a month or two, then they forget about it, then they complain again, and that can go for years. Finally, if you take a careful medical history, you're going to find that these kids have severe hypersensitivity to touch, to sound. Some of them have to light. And if you go back in the history, most of the uh, appearances of these symptoms is going to be sometimes between 18 and 24 months. Finally, there are ticks and adventitious movements, and they have been identified in about 39% of the patients. All right. So you heard about basal ganglia, and uh, I just want to give you, you know, two cents of my thoughts about it. First thing is, everybody talks about basal ganglia. Well, I got news for you. There are seven of them anatomically, and there are nine of them uh, functionally. So which is it? I personally believe it is related to corpus striatum. Corpus striatum has been considered by neuropathologists to be a controller of our thoughts or of our emotions. So it's something that we're going to discuss in a minute. Now, the problem with the laboratory data, you know, everybody does stuff, okay? Unfortunately, laboratory data are not terribly helpful in pandas. If you have a positive streptococcal titers, well, anybody can have it. You don't have to have pandas for it. If you have a non-specific uh, autoimmune markers, like uh, anti-nuclear antibodies elevated, well, anybody you know, with rheumatoid arthritis or whatever can have it. So I think you know, it's important to do the blood work, but in my estimation, it's worth only 5% of diagnosis. So negative blood work does not exclude possibility of pandas. Positive blood work does not confirm it. It only supports it. Now, there is obviously a question about of Cunningham panel. So I have known Maddy Cunningham for probably 20 years, if not longer. I have done quite a bit of them, and I have found, found it to be somewhat unrealable in children less than 12 to 14. So younger kids frequently have a false negatives. Older kids, 14 and above, Cunningham panel appears to be quite reliable. All right. Now, let me go, and I think this is probably the most important thing I'm going to discuss with that uh, today, and that is the symptoms of pandas. I gave you all this statistic. You can see I just went over them. It's more important to understand the kid. So, what happens to children in pandas? It's a single symptom. When you have an affection of the corpus striatum, you lose ability to control your thoughts. Under normal circumstances, right now I'm seeing all of you, I'm thinking what I'm going to say next, I'm watching my hand, so I have a, 10 thoughts in my head. But I'm perfectly capable of grasping and following a single thought. The reason I'm able to do so is the basal ganglia, likely corpus striatum. Actually, it's conductor of my thoughts. Since five to six per second impulses, they end up in part of brain where thoughts arise, and they're like a metronome on your, on your piano. So, under normal circumstances, the basal ganglia hopefully, uh, uh, corpus striatum, is conductor, and the thoughts are instruments in the orchestra. Normally, conductor conducts, thoughts play beautiful music. What happens in pandas is, conductor quits. There is no control of thoughts. 
So classically, when child is tired, when they are not distracted, or when they are trying to fall asleep, the thoughts start coming in waves. Thought after thought is going through their heads. They cannot stop it. As a result of that, they get terrified. So, first thing you're going to see, these kids cannot fall asleep. Second thing you're going to see, these kids are not listening. They are continuously trying to control their thoughts, so their short-term memory is shot. These kids can pee their pants. You remember the old say, I was so scared I peed my pants? Merry Christmas, this is what happens here. These kids feel unsafe anywhere. So when you are totally scared, the only safe place is near your mom or your house, depending on the age. So these kids basically try to isolate themselves. And if you, as a parent, ask them simple question, what do you want to eat or whatever, these kids just go berserk start yelling, you know, have a temper tantrums. Why? Because you are interacting by simple question, their effort to control their thoughts. So, please ask the patients always three questions. Question number one is, when you are trying to fall asleep, does it happen that your thoughts start running through your head, you cannot stop them? That, by the way, does not happen in any other psychiatric illness. Question number two is, does it happen sometimes that a single thought, frequently weird thought, gets stuck in your head, you got to think it over and over again? And final third question is, you get up in the morning, perfectly nice day, do you sometimes have a feeling like somebody is sitting on your chest? You feel like something is going to happen, although you know nothing is going to happen, is that feeling of doom. If the patient answers these three questions positively, I think you better get busy because it's likely to be pandas. Now, diagnosis of pandas has been discussed for past 24 years, okay? So you have all these symptoms, and, but we don't have a standard. How do you really diagnose pandas? If the kid has ADHD but doesn't have tics, is he pandas or not? So what I have tried to do is to devise some kind of mathematical formula to help you out with it. So I devised basically three levels of criteria. One is absolute criteria, second is major criteria, and third level is minor criteria. So absolute criteria that is present in just about 96.5 patients is a sudden onset of symptoms. Mother takes the kid to the school one way, picks him up, it's a completely different kid. Mother puts the child in the bed one way, next morning child wakes up as a completely different kid. Now, a sudden onset, unfortunately, is not very easy to discover in patients in whom real symptoms started much earlier. You know, changing the personality, changing behavior, in a child two to, years, uh, two to four years old, it's hard to understand for the parents. But I think it's important to look for it. Major criteria are basically five simple symptoms. One is the running thoughts that I mentioned. Second is separation anxiety. Third is OCD symptoms. Fourth is tics or adventitious movements. Now, we all in all times would consider tics and adventitious movements to be pure neurological disorder. No, they're not. They are in pandas, they are a physical expression of OCD, right? And finally, anorexia. So those are major criteria. And then just to mention, separation anxiety, there are two subtypes. 
Subtype one is when the kid is attached to the mother's hip, she cannot go to the bedroom, do nothing, kid is screaming. The subtype two is usually in older kids, 12 and older, where the kids are more focused or fixed on the house or a certain room. Now, anorexia, there are also two subtypes for clinical evaluation. Subtype number one is the one that we see in younger kids, 12 and younger, that's a quote-unquote logical explanation for refusing the food. You know, fear of choking on the food, fear being poisoned by food, you know, inability to swallow because the, there is a strange smell or texture, okay? So there is a very descriptive explanation from kids 12 or younger. In kids 12 and older, however, we start seeing the body image problems, okay? And those are frequently then mixed with the typical anorexia nervosa. Now, we discussed the absolute criteria, major criteria. There are two groups of minor criteria. One is general anxiety, sleep disorder, behavioral regression, emotional uh, dep you know, uh, liability, depression, self-injurious behavior, hallucinations. Uh, group two would be poor eye contact, you know, white pupils, urinary frequency or enuresis, short-term memory loss, fine motor skill deterioration, okay? Uh, selective mutism and then abdominal pain. Now, let me just reflect on one of these. That is fine motor skill deterioration. The classical symptoms of pandas is dysgraphia, inability to write properly. Now, it was everybody's opinion in agreement was that there is a deterioration of fine motor skills and therefore kid is unable to write. Until we found out something completely different. Three years ago I had a consecutively three patients, two from Canada, one from I think Georgia, who had a very interesting symptom. Before pandas, they were left-handed or right-handed. When they developed pandas, they went opposite. And after we treated them, they went back to the original uh, dominant side. So after we started, look, uh, started looking into it, what we found that these kids have a difficulty sometimes hitting the ball because when they're doing the baseball, they have a right stand, but they change it to left. Kid who is playing soccer, instead of using the right foot, it's using the left foot, etc. So, what we found is that actually these kids lose ability to identify the dominant side. So they're just guessing which hand to use. So diagnostic formula that I use, if it helps you, that would be great. It's pretty simple. Formula one is we have a <clears throat> one absolute criteria that means that sudden answer. And then we need to have a two major criteria. That makes the diagnosis 80% likely. If, however, we cannot elicit the sudden answer, then basically we go with the two major criteria, three minor criteria, and to make sure that there is at least one criteria from each of the groups I submitted to you, okay? Supporting evidence would be positive strep titers, but let me reflect on that. Uh, strep titers are terrible tests. They're older than me, and as you can see, I'm not exactly a teenager, okay? They have a problem because they have a 30% false negative readings. So, uh, Pat Cleary, microbiologist from University of uh, Minnesota, 
three, four years ago, designed so-called ELISA ASO Titer that was quite reliable. Unfortunately, nobody wanted to commercialize it, so we are stuck with this. So having negative strep titers doesn't mean anything. <coughs> having positive, it is a supporting evidence, but does not determine the diagnosis. Second is, we found that a lot of kids in acute stages of pandas have a leukopenia. We are not sure what is the reason for it, but it's something to remember. I have found approximately 35-40% of the patients with pandas have a positive antinuclear antibodies, and it's usually speckled pattern. Okay? There are some exceptions, but usually it's a speckled pattern. IgE is frequently elevated in these patients, especially in the long-term cases. Now, I check Epstein-Barr virus in all patients. If I find Epstein-Barr virus in a patient 12 or older, IgG or IgM, it really does, clinically doesn't mean much. Exposure is so common, it's everywhere. However, what I have identified, I've had a group of about six kids who were six years or younger who developed sudden anorexia. And in those kids, I was able to document positive both IgM and IgG or, you know, uh, uh, for Epstein-Barr virus. So I normally do that. Finally, you have a patient whom you diagnose this pandas, you treat it, what we're going to discuss in a minute, and the patient fails. Or patient improves, and then it has a rebound. One of the most common reasons for that appear to be elevated circulatory immune complexes. Uh, I have found in long-term pandas, untreated pandas, CIC are frequently elevated. And if you do the, you give them IVIG, chances are it might not work too well. So you have to address that first. All right. <clears throat> now, the blood work has just suggested, okay. Now, for me personally, 80% of diagnosis is typical medical history. So I think you got to pay attention to it. 10% of diagnosis is positive response to antibiotic. And as I said, 5% of diagnosis is positive blood work. Now, the treatment of pandas, essentially, in my opinion, it's very simple. Step number one, is a removal of adenosine tonsils. You heard, you heard in the previous presentation about <coughs> uh, TH17 cells, you know, cytokines, etc. Believe it or not, before this was presented just recently, within the past few months, uh, the group in Greece in 2000 did a small study on about 25 patients whom they remove adenos and tonsils, and they found that the panda significantly improved in 60 some percent of them. I spoke to them a couple of years later, and unfortunately, even the kids who were completely recovered did get a rebound of symptoms within two years. Then, okay, the, in 2017, Dritan Agilu. Uh, reported presence of TH17 cells in the mucosal membrane of sinuses and in adenoids and tonsils. So from that point on, I studied it with the Hurley at Georgetown, we found that the kids whom you take adenoids and tonsils out first and then follow that with the IVIG essentially do much better to give you the numbers. Before obligatory removal of adenos and tonsils, success rate in properly diagnosed patient was about 68%. Since we started taking adenos and tonsils out, 
the success rate has gone up to 78%. More importantly, however, the relapse rate in the previous group, the one without removal of other tonsils, was 28%. But since we started taking other tonsils out, depending on the age group, it's now 8 to 12%. So the first step, in my opinion, is removal of other tonsils. There is depending on the age, between about 10 and 25% chance, younger the patient, higher chance is, that actually the removal of other incidences could put them into remission that could last several months, sometimes a few years. So it's something to seriously consider. The second and final step is intravenous immunoglobulin, or IVIG. As you know, IVIG is not exactly you know, uh, nerve science, okay? It has been used in almost 40 different diseases, okay? And actually, it's quite effective in pandas. The problem with the IVIG is to make sure that you prepare the terrain. So, other instances have to be out. Make sure child doesn't have any concurring infection in sinuses or whatever and then appears to be quite effective. Now, there are two school of thoughts. And one is the original one, where we do one treatment, <coughs> uh, and it's a high dose, 1.5 to 2 grams, depending on the severity of symptoms. And then there is a second school of thought that started on the East Coast, where, where they try to do it monthly. I'm personally very much against the monthly uh, infusions because I have found a good number of these kids. Not only that they don't improve, but actually they can get worse because of accumulation of uh, circulating immune complexes. All right, now, there, are, there is a whole bunch of, there are 12, to my knowledge, 12 different uh, preparations on the market, okay? You know, there are 5%, 10%, then you have uh, whatever you want. Actually, any of those works, all right? But there are a couple of problems. One that I have used forever uh, was the Gamunex. Uh, it was designed by Bayer in Germany and then imported, Telacris took it over, and I found that one to have uh, certain advantages. Advantage number one is it's absolutely pure. No infection, no transmission of any infectious agent ever was reported. Secondly, the side effects are minimal, okay? The only problem is it's about 20% more expensive than the rest of them. Now, I don't get paid by Bayer, so don't worry about that. I'm just giving you my experience, okay? Now, after you do the IVIG, essentially the game is not over. There are a couple of things that need to be done. First, I prefer to keep them on preventative antibiotic, low-dose antibiotic for a year. The result of that, is decreased incidence of strep infection because in my experience, streptococcal infection, even single one, within three months after IVIG can undo the whole thing. Now, as the time goes on and you are done with the preventative antibiotic, the future of these kids essentially has only two cautions. One is if they ever end up with the three or more strep infections that go untreated, they can get a relapse. So they can, I have seen relapse at 46 or 60, okay? So that's the point number one. What is important to your patients to tell them that after everything is said and done, they are cold fine, they are cold healthy, that their only symptoms of strep is not going to be sore throat, headache, fever, all the stuff we know as a strep. Their only symptom in the future will be typical pandas uh, symptoms. So 
Yeah. Kid goes to college, calls mom, I just had a panic attack or I just got a bad thought. It's not pandas. It's a strep. So as long as that's taken care of within a reasonable period, three, four days, treated properly, a relapse of pandas is unlikely. Second point. About uh, 15 years ago, I kind of became aware of the fact that even in children that are called cure, when they go to dentist, even for the teeth cleaning, they would have uh, flares of symptoms, what was extremely unusual. So at that time I decided I would recommend, until we clear the air, recommend to give them prevent as the antibiotic I chose one day before, five days after, and it appears to work. But I have been just terrorized with the thought that I'm giving something that I have absolutely no proof that should be done. And lo and behold, I'm putting together a little study with the University of Texas in Houston. And there was a gentleman there who came with an interesting observation. He found that certain group of people, not pun, certain group of population, after they have a strep infection and you treat it and cure it with a negative throat culture, they can excrete the remnants of strep DNA, fragments of strep DNA in their saliva <clears throat> for several months after. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And as I said, you know, I found it's really downside is minimal. I like to keep these kids on the preventative antibiotic. Right. All right, so let me just get, go through a couple of myths. And first thing is, there is a myth out there that antibiotics can cure pandas. They don't. Essentially, you are just keeping things under the surface, under control, and that can last only several months or sometimes a couple of years. But eventually, kid is going to break through and just blow up. Second uh, suggestion out there is that the steroids can help cure the pandas. They don't. As a matter of fact, steroid burst that I use as a diagnostic tool in pandas was invented by me in 2001, and it was never meant to be a treatment. We do, however, use steroids in, under certain circumstances like uh, with the uh, high uh, circulating immune complexes, etc. So there is a place for it, but in a typical case, no, there, is, there are not the treatment. Third thing you're going to hear that uh, kid is going to outgrow it. Well, they don't. They learn to live with it. But let me give an example of what can happen. A few years ago, uh, I had a I was in the office, my secretary jumps in and says, well, there is a, a man with his mom. They want to talk to you for a few minutes. And she said, but he's holding her hand. So to make a long story short, the gentleman was diagnosed with pandas <clears throat> at age of about eight or nine, uh, never treated. He was compensated finished the school, got married, had two children, got a massive strep infection, and the reaction was left wife and children, went to mother's house and insisted to sleep with her in the bed. So unfortunately, it can catch up with you sooner or later. So finally, uh, there is one more thing. All right, yeah, there is a general tendency these days to use any, uh, uh, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And I don't have any problems with it. Actually, in some kids, they do work quite well. The problem is you cannot use them forever. First, they have a short-term side effects, you know, stomach, gut problem, 
they have a long-term side effects, you know, cardiac, they have a problem with uh, decreasing the villi in the gut, etc. So intermittent use is fine, chronic use, I am absolutely against it. The problem is I have not found it to work. As a matter of fact, pandas kids appear to be more likely to get suicidal with it than the average population. So you can try with it, but as I said, I have not found it to resolve the problem. Right. Now, what do you do with the kids who fail the IVIG? Well, plasma phoresis has been shown to work quite well. The problem with plasma phoresis is that cannot be used as the only treatment because it's only temporary relief. So you have to follow that with the IVIG and a combination of those two in severe cases, it's quite good. So that's about it. I try to do it as fast as I can. A little bit about me. Um, I graduated from nursing school in 1990 and I worked for 10 years as a ER and pediatric ICU nurse. And then in 2000, I graduated as a PA. I did a year of family practice and was in the ER ever since. Um, after my daughter got very sick with pandas and was helped by uh, Dr. K, uh, she's doing fantastic now, very proud of her. Uh, my wife and I felt obligated to do what we could to help kids uh, with this condition, to raise awareness and uh, to hopefully treat these kids. And I got an opportunity to work in a clinic in Wisconsin that a friend of mine had started. She was gracious enough to let me have some space there and to start seeing kids with this. And we've had some good success over the last uh, couple of years um, treating them in the clinic. And I've also refu referred many patients uh, to Dr. K. Also, two of the patients, the two that I'm presenting today, are actually siblings, and uh, they were both uh, referred to Dr. K. Um, when I uh, talk about these kids, it's important to know their family history. Um, first of all, there was no significant mental health issues in the family. Uh, the parents are highly educated. Mother is a medical professional and an advanced uh, practice provider. Um, there was no family history of significant autoimmune conditions and everybody in the family was healthy, happy and thriving prior to the onset of the uh, PANS pandas. Um, I first saw her at age 13, but her symptoms started at age 7. She had two back-to-back -back streptococcal infections and was diagnosed with scarlet fever. Shortly thereafter, she developed severe anxiety, emotional outbursts, and OCD behaviors, and her symptoms kind of waxed and waned for a couple of years. And this is a pattern I've seen in a lot of kids that have come to see me. They'll have an initial bad outburst and then kind of wax and wane for several years before they actually come to the, to the appropriate diagnosis. At age nine, she had another episode of fear and anxiety and was diagnosed with separation anxiety. Um, again, muddled along pretty well until age 12 when she kind of fell off the cliff with symptoms and they became debilitating. Uh, during her um, year uh, after that, she was diagnosed with multiple mental health uh, diagnoses, including anxiety, OCD, suicidal ideation, uh, even intellectual disability, schizophrenia spectrum, major depressive disorder, and panic disorder were just some of the diagnoses she was given. Um, this is a brief history of the hospitalizations, both inpatient and outpatient that she had. In May of 2020, she was inpatient for depression and anxiety and started on fluoxetine. In June 2020, uh, intensive partial hospitalization program for anxiety and depression. September 2020, intensive outpatient for OCD, anxiety, depression. Had her fluoxetine increased to 40 a day. Um, and then in December, she was inpatient for suicidal thoughts and hallucinations, and they recommended a residential facility at that time. Um, in 2021, she returned to intensive outpatient therapy for persistent symptoms, 
and had a neuropsych evaluation that determined that she was cognitively impaired. And again, this is one of those bright, active, uh, verbally advanced kids that Dr. K described earlier. This was her, um, and now they're diagnosing her as cognitively impaired. In March of 2021, she was seen in the emergency department for an attempted overdose. The stress of the constant fear and anxiety and OCD was just overwhelming for her. Um, and so she was just trying to end the anxiety. And then in uh, August, she was inpatient at another facility uh, with psychiatric features, followed by a partial day program, and they recommended um, admission to an eating disorder program at that time because now she was developing restrictive eating. During this time, she also had multiple visits with a licensed clinical social worker, psychiatry, and interventions with the mobile psych crisis team. This uh, next slide is from that period of time, and um, it, I think it's very telling. Uh, this dark figure over her is telling her that if she doesn't switch the th light switch three times, she's going to die. If she doesn't clean her room, her dad's going to die. Um, if she doesn't do it all exactly right, everybody's going to die. And this is the kind of stress that these kids are living with. Um, and some of these behaviors that kind of drive us crazy with Pans Pandas kids, they will do something repetitively or they won't do certain things. In their mind, they may actually try, be trying to prevent the death of a parent. To them, it's that important. And we're talking to them, just cross that threshold, just walk through that door, and they're refusing. It's not oppositional defiant. They may be trying to save a life. And I think that's an important perspective to have. Uh, when we're dealing with them and, you know, as, as a father, getting frustrated with them at times. Um, when she saw me at the initial appointment, her uh, OCD symptoms were debilitating, her anxiety was debilitating. She felt really hopeless that her condition would not improve. Uh, parents were reporting oppositional behaviors, aggressive rage, including breaking things. School performance had declined s severely. Her uh, food refusal led to a 20-pound weight loss. She had insomnia and visual and auditory hallucinations. Again, all these things that Dr. K was talking about, these symptoms you can see here. By the time she saw me, her medications had been changed. She was on Geodon 40 daily, Lexapro 5 milligrams daily, Guanfancine 1 milligram daily, and also supplements of B12, D, and C. Um, I won't go through all this. Her initial exam for me physically was completely normal with the exception of being very emotionally withdrawn, uh, kind of tucked in on herself, and I find that to be very common. Either they're hyper alert, as was described earlier, or they're very withdrawn, very sad. Um, she was appropriate during the exam, uh, but you could see the weight of the world on her shoulders. Um, my initial exam, um, lab work, you can see here a lot of that is what uh, Dr. K had alluded to earlier. Since working with uh, sending patients to him, I've added the other tests like the circulating immune complexes um, to my workup also. Um, the Cunningham panel I have not ordered because it's very expensive. It's not covered by insurance, and I don't personally find it absolutely necessary to making the diagnosis. I think it's supportive. Of her labs, and this is common that you'll do a huge panel of labs and find very few abnormalities. Her anti-DNAs B was elevated, her ASO titer was elevated, and her vitamin D was low. Everything else was normal on her. Um, we started her on Keflex, uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram per day, and a short course of naproxen. Uh, I also believe that uh, NSAIDs should be used more short course um, and uh, not long term. Um, we also discuss lifestyle modifications, optimal diet, sleep hygiene, screen time, suicide prevention, and others. I will tell you, though, that when a kid is in flare and a family is in crisis, it's very, very hard to do um, these lifestyle modifications. I believe they can help, but, you know, Focus on getting your kid to uh, treatment, getting their meds in them, and we'll work on the rest later as far as the lifestyle. 
Uh, suicide prevention, I do believe, is very important. You have to watch these kids very carefully because they're under so much stress. They're under constant fear and anxiety, and they just want it to stop. Uh, I did recommend um, continuing to work with mental health providers uh, for the medication management end of it and ERP and CBT therapy, although I will tell you the therapies um, are much better when the kid is out of an acute flare. When they're in an acute flare, the brain just isn't open for business uh, or processing uh, these therapies that can otherwise be helpful. Um, we also discussed at that time the possibility, because of the direction she was going, of even getting a feeding tube um, and going to um, inpatient. She had some improvement with the initial course of antibiotics and the non-steroidals. Uh, Dr. K was very kind to get her in and get her seen quickly because of the severity of her condition. Tonsillectomy and IVIG therapy was ordered. Um, she did have some improvement, as was alluded to in the previous talk, with the tonsillectomy, and uh, we were grateful for that and noticed the benefit. Um, but it wasn't until the addition of the IVIG therapy that the switch flipped and we started making real good, real steady progress. Um, so she came off of her psychiatric medications shortly after that. She was given the one-year course of Augmentin. Um, we continue to do uh, antibiotics for confirmed infections um, and prior to dental procedures. Um, so you saw the long list of psychiatric interventions and things like that. I think it's really important to note that since her IVIG therapy, she has not required um, any psychiatric medications uh, or further hospitalizations or interventions. She has had a few episodes of anxiety here and there. Um, we continue to treat with antibiotics, like I said, for confirmed infections, and we're talking about adding low-dose naltrexone, which I have found to be beneficial in 50% of people and really beneficial in about 25%. And I've only had one patient that I've had to take off of for, for side effects. Um, so really a remarkable story. Uh, Mom just sent me a picture of a beautiful, healthy young lady holding her eighth grade diploma, smiling ear to ear. She's now an AB student and uh, doing great, living her best life. Um, her mom and I uh, talk because our daughters had so many similarities in, in their journey uh, that it, it's kind of uncanny and even their personality and their likes and dislikes. So it's, it's been fun to watch her uh, just totally change. Um, and I've been grateful to be part of that. Um, unfortunately for the family, um, the seven-year-old sister came to see me uh, with a sudden onset of increased uh, anxiety, especially separation anxiety. She had some vocal tics and she would have this thing where she'd repetitively question her parents for looking for reassurance or asking them to say the thing, something the right way or to say it nicer. Um, her physical exam was unremarkable. I should note, too, her symptoms started after COVID-19 infection and a sore throat. And one of the things that I'm seeing is a lot of new case studies of sudden onset OCD following COVID-19. And I think this is going to be really important for driving this concept that autoimmunity can cause psychiatric conditions. And I think that's going to help us a lot in the future of making this more accepted. Um, her uh, exam was unremarkable. Throat culture, lab uh, for rapid strep, ASO, and anti-DNAs B were all normal. Um, she was started on antibiotics at that time. She came back to see me on June 8th with a sore throat, followed by even worse separation anxiety, OCD, need for constant reassurance, and now violent outbursts. Um, we diagnosed her with pharyngitis due to physical exam findings. Uh, she had exudate and soft palipatechiae, and we diagnosed her with PANS at that time. And we restarted the Augmentin that she had completed um, for another 10 days, and we had some improvement after that. Um, June 20th, she kind of had plateaued and was still having anxiety and OCD symptoms, and we switched her to Zithromax because a sibling tested positive, positive for mycoplasma at that time. Um, again, this is that waxing and waning better with antibiotics, worse off um, 
slowly after coming off the antibiotics, uh, regressing again when the next infection hits. Um, and this was the case here on August 15th. Uh, she was diagnosed with pharyngitis and given amoxicillin by uh, one of my clinic colleagues. Um, on October 22nd, she had a significant change in behavior, even worse than before, uh, with decreased concentration, restricted eating. And uh, this goes to the regression that these kids will experience, baby talk and things like that. In her case, she was demanding that her mother would feed her. She had the classic that we see with Pan's Panda's decline in her handwriting and math ability. Um, we started her on Keflex and we gave her a course of prednisolone at that time and we did a full Pandas Pandal, that previous lab that I showed you, again, um, without real significant findings on that. She did get better with the Keflex and prednisone, prednisolone, um, but then had significant nasal discharge a short time later and we needed a nasal culture which grew out uh, Pantoia. And then we treated that with Bactrim after consulting the infectious disease uh, at Children's Hospital. Up to December 22nd, we were doing better, and then she had a significant flare, and she tested positive for mycoplasma uh, and also Coxsackie virus and was given a course of Zithromax. Um, she did develop a yeast infection uh, from the recurrent antibiotics, one of the side effects of the antibiotics. Um, and we were having diminishing response to antibiotics and a second trial of steroids actually ended up with rage. Um, I agree uh, with the previous talk that I haven't found uh, steroids to be particularly effective. I, I actually have found the NSAIDs to be more effective than the steroids. Um, in February 24, she had, of 2023, she had a pre-op exam for her tonsillectomy and it showed um, on the pre-op exam, she had a complete resolution of her symptoms after the antibiotic Zithromax. She had no complaints and that was that time was normal. Her parents fought a heroic battle with insurance uh, and healthcare providers to get her the tonsillectomy. Um, previously, they had to go um, and try to find somebody who would do the tonsillectomy for child number one, and they found one doctor who was willing to do it in Wisconsin, but he had retired. Uh, so they were left with nobody who could do this, and so the tonsillectomy had to be done in Illinois where they could find a uh, doctor, and that I was out of pocket, and I believe the out of pocket expense for the family at that time was uh, around $8,000 um, because we couldn't find somebody who would do the tonsillectomy here. Um, Mon March 8th, so she had her tonsillectomy followed by Omnicef. The pathology report showed no strep, but it did show uh, pseudomonas, surprisingly. Um, her math and handwriting have improved. Teachers have noticed behavior improvement. Anxiety is reduced and, great, and uh, violent outbursts have resolved. Um, we're looking for ID consult for re and repeat throat cultures to ensure pseudomonas is cleared. Pseudomonas is a bacteria that's really hard to clear uh, with anything other than IV antibiotics. Uh, or antibiotics that we typically reserve for adults. So um, it's a, it's, this is a tricky one. Um, we are still uh, in the process of considering um, IVIG therapy and that's definite uh, possibility for her. And we'll closely monitor her for symptom changes and you know, promptly treat her for any infections. Um, so when I was doing this talk, um, preparation, I thought of all the things that when my kid was going through this, I wanted providers uh, and teachers to know. And then I also put this out there to the PANDAS board, and I think um, a lot of people had the same ideas. There's a few things we want providers and parents to know, or uh, teachers to know. One is that parents are not crazy and neither is their kid. Parents are stressed, they haven't slept, they haven't ate, they haven't had a moment of time to themselves, they're financially stressed, they're incredibly worried about their kids, they're not crazy, they're just pushed to the limit. And the last thing we need to do is push them over the edge. Um, their child is not crazy. The amazing thing about these kids is you will see the worst behavior you could imagine and then suddenly your kid is there for a few minutes. Their old self, their old laugh, an idea, something they like is there. And you know your kid's in there and you just gotta break them out. 
if I get a little emotional, <laughs> um, it's uh, having walked this walk. Um, they are traumatized by what they're experiencing and what their child has suffered through. Um, they're scared to even say pans pandas to certain providers. It's all over the message boards for the parents of this. When you go to see so-and-so or when you go to this facility or when you go to the ER, don't mention pans pandas because you're going to be judged. Uh, and they're, they're afraid to even tell providers that, and it, it shouldn't be that way. Um, they've spent countless hours researching, trying to find out what's wrong with their kid and how to help them. They know a lot about their kid. They know a lot about their kid's health, um, and we need to respect that. School refusal is a major symptom. Um, they're terrified to go to school. They're terrified to walk through the door. Sometimes homebound inst uh, instruction is necessary. Um, this is not a discipline issue. This is brain inflammation. Um, listen without judgment and be willing to help the patient if needed or to refer to somebody if necessary who does treat pans pandas. Um, what I would like people to know is the most important part, uh, this is for providers, the most important part of the diagnosis I think is good history, followed by physical exam, followed by response to meds, and then labs. This disease is 10 steps forward after treatment, if, after successful treatment. Uh, and eight steps back. Um, and then I think we'll just close with that. I want to tell you one last thing. There's a lot of hope here. Um, there's a lot of new research coming out. There's a lot of interest in uh, autoimmune causing mental health conditions. Um, and uh, I think that's going to open up new studies. There's repurposed medications that are there. I think one of the biggest reasons for hope is the previous talk where you've just seen for yourself how many of these kids we can help with IVIG therapy and appropriate use of antibiotics and NSAIDs. And with that, I'll close. Thank you.